Hey, everybody, come on in. Let's worship together. Welcome to church. We're gonna have a good time this morning. Remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he rose and he died. Those giants are dead now. morning. Let's pray just real quick. Jesus, we love you so much. This morning is for you. It's about you. We worship you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You over all things, and we love you, Jesus. This is for you. We give you our praise. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
Have a seat and get cozy here for our family time. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so wonderful here to see you on another wonderful Sunday morning that we've been given by our Father and glorious, powerful Savior. I am very happy to be here with you this morning. My name is Bree, and I'm part of the church family here and get to worship with you here this morning. If you are a guest with us today, we are very happy to have you with us. If this is your first time, welcome. We are who we are. You see we are here, a church family who loves Jesus and each other. We're not perfect, but we follow a perfect Savior. Right? So if you are just joining us this morning, we'd love for you to pull your phone out and text the word welcome to the number that you'll see on the screen. That'll get you to Miss Ashley. She's our connections minister here, and she would love to give you a gift to say thank you for joining us this morning. We are so happy you're here with us. Also, I would like to take some time to welcome our online family that are watching online. Hey, we are so happy to have you worshiping with us as well. Welcome. I would like to kind of get into our family time today by talking about CH Connect. We've been talking about this for a few weeks now, kind of working through those of us who are just joining our family or learning about our church family. Today is the day. Today is CH Connect. We have lunch available and childcare available today as well. We would love for you to join us. This is a time where if you're new or newer to College Heights, you can find out about our staff here, how to get involved, and the powerful way we love each other here at our church. We'd love for you to meet us in the atrium right there. It's just through these doors at the area where they serve the coffee. That's where we'll be meeting up. Also, a couple of weeks ago, we've been kind of talking about this envelope fundraiser that we've been doing. It's a way for us to help support our student ministries here at College Heights and the trips that we'll be taking in the spring and summer. And I have to tell you that 
my kiddos have benefited so much from our, our student ministry does such a powerful job of discipling our children and our young adults here. And those trips are very powerful times for them to make some great decisions for Jesus and for their future. And so if you would like to be a part of giving to that, we have the envelopes there on the north side of the atrium, kind of in a wood panel. If you want to snag one of those, if you feel led, you can put your gift in there. And then just drop it in the black giving boxes that you'll see kind of at the exits here to the auditorium. That would be wonderful. Also, if you have given to that in the last couple weeks online, we would love for you to shoot a message to the email address you're going to see here on the screen. That will get you to Miss Brenda. Earhart, just so we can keep track of that and get that added um, correctly. We do now have a drop down menu from our CH um, app. If you want to go to chjoplin.org slash give, there's a drop down menu there that if you go to that, it's just the camp scholarships. And that will get you to your giving there if you'd like to do that online. Here at College Heights, like I said, we are our church family who love Jesus. When you come here, what can you expect? Well, you're for sure going to get some worship, right? We're going to be worshiping our Father. We sing songs here because we are praising him for getting us through the week. I don't know about how some of the parents who came in here today, how, how easy or hard it was to get your little ones to church today, but you made it, right? We made it and they're being discipled. But this is what we do here. Also, we take communion. That's what you see up here in the front and in the back in these trays. It's our reminder of that powerful sacrifice that Jesus made to give us life, this whole world salvation. We take that very seriously here. We also read the word of God. That is, we believe, the infallible, powerful, truthful word of Jesus Christ. And we take that very seriously here. We stand by it, and we read that here on Sunday mornings. Also, you'll see us praying together. When we pray together, this is a part of our worship. It's our way to continue our worship to our powerful Savior. You'll see people walking forward during the service and praying, or just people on the sides praying with what we call our prayer partners. We invite you to do that with us later on in the service. Also, we give our offering. This is also a part of our worship. It's a time where we get to give back and say thank you to God for providing for us. If you would like to do that this morning, you can do that. We've been kind of talking about that for several weeks, have like a little schematic up here. If you want to do that to start some recurring giving, we have a QR code that should be up there here in a little bit, where you can just kind of point the camera of your phone there and you can get that set up really easy. If you are just new to the giving process and you just want to know more about that, you can start by doing that, by giving 10% of your gifts if you, if you feel so led. Or if you would like, you can give over and above that if you want to pray about that faithfully as a family. As we continue to worship this morning, I would like to invite us to pray together, to bless our time of worship. And thanks to our Savior. Let's pray. Father God, you are holy. We thank you, God, for this deep breath of fresh air, of your Holy Spirit, that we get to come in here as a church family. And remember the forgiveness. Remember that, Lord, we are not perfect, but you are. And we thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to talk about family matters. We pray that as we continue in our worship, that you would bless it. But more than anything, it would be a sweet savor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. My name is Lane. Uh, I'm, I'm an elder here at College Heights. I'm thrilled to be with you this morning. And, and in my opinion, unchangeable and immovable opinion, one of the most magical places in the world is Wichita, Kansas. 
And that's not because of Wichita itself necessarily. To be honest, I've actually never even seen a whole lot of Wichita, but the part that I've seen is magical. And that's because when I was growing up, a couple times a year, me and my brothers and our like, and on all of our cousins, there was like 15 of us total, and we would descend upon Wichita, Kansas from all over the country so that we could go spend a week or so at Nana and Papa's house. And yeah, that's right. Yeah, is right. Nana and Papa's house was magical. We'd play football. We'd make up games. We'd do shows. We'd do all the kinds of things that cousins do when they're at Nana and Papa's house. <clears throat> and, at, and at Nana and Papa's house in Wichita, Kansas, there was this one place in particular that was the coolest place at, in, at, at the house to hang out. Now, the basement was where we hung out most of the time, but even cooler than that was this closet that was under the stairs that went down into the basement. That place, it's like the Holy of Holies. It was the best. Like, it was kind of like the innermost part of the house, and in there is the coolest place to hang out. They had everything that you could possibly want in that space, I assume. I actually don't know because I never really got to go into that closet because for as long as I could remember, the closet under the stairs in the basement at Nana and Papa's house was the Big Cousin Club. And in order to get into the Big Cousin Club, you had to have a password. And to have the password, you had to be a big cousin, which I wasn't. And so year after year, I would sit outside the door and try to guess the password. And I would knock on the door and I would bang and I would plead and I would beg for the password. Please just let me in. Please let me into that place. I want to be in there with the cool kids where the DC talk is blaring through the door and there's laughter and what I can only assume is just great frivolity. And so I'm sitting on the outside and I'm just begging for it and until finally one year I'd had enough. I was over it. They pushed me to my absolute limit. And so I did the only thing left at my disposal, the only thing left that I could possibly do. Some may call it, you know, a, a, a petty move. Others, a war crime. Most people would call it somewhere in between, but I had had enough. You got to fight with the weapons you got, and they left me no choice. So I went upstairs, and I told mom. <laughs> it was a classic tattle, okay? Never been a huge tattletale, but had I known how well it would have worked, then I'd have done it a long time ago. Because my mom wasn't really in the mood to mediate a fight between me and my, and my brother and, you know, and, and our cousins and stuff. And so she just kind of called down the stairs, Drew, Drew's my older brother, one of the big cousins. Drew, tell Lane the password. I was like, that's it? That, it was that easy? I, I, I couldn't believe it. I was sitting outside and I was like, I, I, I win. I won. I'm finally going to get access to the cool kids, to the inside jokes, to that land flowing with Dr. Pepper and pretzel sticks that you can hold like this, like they're cigarettes. You know the ones, like when you're a kid? <laughs> I'm finally going to get to go in there and do that thing. And so I was so, and so I was so, and I heard them like before they gave me the password, I heard them in there like whispering to one another, you know, like, like savoring their last moments of a club without me in it until finally uh, my brother Drew reluctantly uh, said, okay. The password is Wiley Coyote. Like, of course, Wiley Coyote. Why didn't I think of that? It's so obvious. So I mustered up all my strength and I just said, Wiley Coyote. And they immediately were like, changed it. And I was like, Dad, gum it. <laughs> Dang it. And I had been beaten. It's like, I can't argue with that. I can't argue with the fact that they changed the password. So I walked away, resigned to my place on the outside, never getting to go into the big cousin club. But boy, uh, we long to belong, don't we? We do. This is all of us thing. I want, to, I want you to know right from the beginning that this is not an introverted or an extroverted thing. Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram have nothing to do with this. Neither does your age, race, gender, or status. This is a broad brush reality that every one of us, deep inside of us, longs to belong. It's a universal truth. And just, by the way, despite what social trends would have you believe, that doesn't make you uncool or weird or cringe or anything else. Have you noticed this? Have you noticed how, like, it's become really, like, popular on social media over the last couple of years to not want to be with people? To, like, have, like, this weird kind of, like, to dislike people or whatever has somehow become cool and avant-garde? That's not true. Don't let people fool you. Longing to belong does not make you uncool. It makes you very purposefully human. 
in order for us to kind of fully grasp this, grasp this this morning, I want us to go on like, I want us to do a little bit of an exercise together, okay? And the exercise is, is, uh, is, is from one of my favorite authors. His name is Justin Whitmell Early. And in his book, Made for People, he takes his readers through an imaginative journey of the creation account in Genesis. And so I'd like for us to kind of to do that this morning. And so just take, just kind of settle in for a second and, and let's imagine this together, okay? So one day, God is being quintessential God. He's making things from nothing. And he's doing this as his triune self. And so really to imagine this right, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they all think that this creation thing is a spectacular idea. It's a wonderful idea. It's going to have hiccups. They know this. But they are providentially certain that it's going to be a smashing success. So picture it for a moment. Close your eyes. And picture for a moment what it would have looked like for light to separate from darkness for the first time. The crash of an unfathomably large number of cubic gallons of water sloshing against the seabed. God the sun, getting down on his knees to trace the shorelines and tell the water where to stop. The father and the son together laughing as the Holy Spirit splashes cosmic buckets of salt water on the earth to see where it falls. Think about what it would have sounded like to hear good ring out over the Himalayan mountain ranges for the first time. Think about a peacock strutting for the first time or a lioness exploring her tail the way cats do. All for the first time and hearing the Trinity shouting in three-part harmony, good, good, good. And there you have the beginning of the world. In the beginning of Genesis, God is creating and designing and he's assigning purpose according to his will. And as he does so, he says good seven times. It's this rhythm. It's this refrain that happens throughout the beginning of the creation account. And then all of a sudden, though, something happens when you get to verse 18 of chapter 2. And the Lord God says, it is not good that man is alone. And really, in the context of the Genesis account, that reads like a record scratch. Like all the music stops. That rhythm that was established is all of a sudden completely halted. And if you believe that the scripture is the inspired word of God, and we do, you have to believe that that's there for a reason. That God does that for a reason. Why? I think it's to stop us in our tracks. I think it's to make sure that we're listening. So let's hear this again. Because I believe that what God just said is one of the most important things he has ever told us. It is not good that you are alone. In the past few years, a new phrase has entered the American vocabulary. Deaths of despair. And I know what you're thinking, that's a sweet band name. And you're right. But it's also a pretty bleak reality. Because it refers to the types of deaths that, have, have, that has lowered the life expectancy in America to its lowest point in over a hundred years. These are things like suicide, alcoholism, drug addiction, and other preventable chronic diseases that stem from chronic isolation and loneliness. Study after study, you can read a million of them just with one quick Google search, shows that chronic loneliness is worse for you than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. For decades, we have intuited that loneliness is killing us, but now for the first time in history, we actually have the medical science that backs it up. Experts call it an epidemic of loneliness because it's the lonely soul that is killing the body. And all of this points to the enduring truth of God in Genesis. It is not good for you to be alone. And you might be sitting there thinking, well, that's okay. I'm not alone. I've got people around me all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm sitting by a couple of them right now. And that's great, right? But sometimes when we think about loneliness, we think about like that boy on the outside of the clubhouse while the cool kids are on the inside and they're being excluded. And, and that's true. And a lot of us have experienced being an outcast at some point. But loneliness takes a lot of different forms and a lot of different shapes. And everyone will experience it at one point or another. Loneliness comes from losing a loved one, right? It comes from seeing a small group dissolve. It comes from having friends move away. It comes from being hurt by someone. It comes from a breakup. It comes from a divorce. 
It comes from being wounded by someone that you love. Ultimately, loneliness is longing for something that you used to have. Your loneliness might come from this paradox where you have like a really strong community in theory, but in reality, you just don't have time for the investment. Maybe it comes from having incredible friends that have moved away or you've lost that friendship for one reason or another. It could come from the pain of not being understood by your family. Maybe it's an isolation that you feel when you're going through something really, really hard. And even though you have friends, you just don't really feel like they understand. If you feel any of this, or have felt any of this, or when you feel any of this, I want you to know um, that you're not just normal, you're actually in the overwhelming majority. This is the new normal of modern American life. Physically, or at least digitally connected, but spiritually isolated. And note that this is a spiritual problem, not just, not just a social one. And as it turns out, it's not just unpleasant, it's actually killing us, body and soul. And this is heartbreaking, right? And it sounds bleak, and it, and it is heartbreaking, and I've been, you know, known to be a bit of an optimist at times. And so you'll forgive me if I tell you that while this is heartbreaking, I actually believe that this is an incredible opportunity. Because much like when Joseph is sold by his brothers into Egypt, I believe that what Satan means for harm, God can and will use for good. And this is the same thing because right now, right now, right now there is a group of people, a large group of people, the majority of people that feel alone. And they're wondering why. And they're trying everything in the world to not feel alone anymore. And it is the church of Jesus that is uniquely positioned to be able to come alongside them and say, I know why. I know why. It's because you were lovingly and purposefully created to belong. And I have got just the place for you. Because never in the history of the world has there been a club or a team or an institution or, or an organization or a party or whatever else that has better embodied the type of belonging that we were created for than the church of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. In, in Hebrews chapter 10, listen to what Jesus has done for us and how we are to respond. This is uh, Hebrews chapter 10, 19, starting in 19. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Did you catch what's going on there? There's a lot. There's a lot. But here's what I want you to see. Is that what's happening in Hebrews 10 is that the, the author of Hebrews is describing what Jesus has done for us and how, we are, and how we ought to respond. I'd encourage you to read the entire chapter later. It's absolutely beautiful. In it, I'll give you the cliff notes. In it, we're given this picture of this priest in the old system who's working tirelessly to make sacrifices for the sins of the people, right? And he's working and he's working and he's working. But ultimately it says those sacrifices are futile and can't possibly remove sin. So in this old system, his job is never done. And he's working and working and he never has that satisfaction of seeing his job finished. Literally as I was writing this sentence for the sermon, I was sitting on the couch in, in, our, in, in our bedroom and Kelly walked in. Um, and just one of the hardest workers I've, I've ever known. And she walks in, and it's night, like it's late into the evening, and she comes in, and she like falls down on the bed, and she says, ah, oh, I haven't sat down all day, right? We've experienced this, this feeling of just not being able to get ahead, of just not being able to get all the things done that need to be done. This is the picture that we have of this priest. The sins are too great, the sacrifice too insufficient, and never getting the satisfaction of saying the job is done. But then we're introduced to another priest, Jesus, our great high priest, 
who then makes the ultimate once and for all final sacrifice for us. And Hebrews 10 tells us that once he's done that, he sits down at the Father's right hand. Why? Because he can. Because the job's done. Because after his sacrifice for us, we don't need any more sacrifice. We are now free, made new, and able to commune with God, able to draw near to God. And that is what our response ought to be, says Hebrews chapter 10. It says, in light of these beautiful truths, in light of this wonderful thing that Jesus, our great high priest, has done for us, what do we do in response? It says, draw near to God. Another way of saying commune with him, worship him. But it didn't stop there. In verse 25, it says, also, let's not give up meeting together, but let's encourage each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews tells us that our two responses to this truth of what Jesus has done for us is to draw near to God and to draw near to each other. Friends, the church is the restored community of believers that satisfies our soul's longing for belonging. And I think that in this chapter, there's three reasons why, and I'd like to explore those this morning. First is this, we belong because we have a shared past. Having a shared past is essential to belonging. Perhaps you've heard of these guys. Yeah, there you go. This is the Bills Mafia. Uh, This is the official supporters of the Buffalo Bills football team. And it is one of the greatest traveling fan bases for the NFL in the country. And this is a picture of them doing what they do best, which is jumping off something high onto a plastic table with the intent on crashing through it. Now, I'm not here to comment on the collective intelligence of the Bills Mafia (laughs) or the blood alcohol content for that matter. I'm just here to talk about this unique bond that they have, this kind of tightness that they have with one another. And I think it's really fascinating, their dedication that they have, this group of fans that are just rabid for their team. And the reason I think it's fascinating is because the team that they're rabid for has won nothing. <laughs> They've won nothing. My little brother Tyler is actually a member of the Bills Mafia. He's a massive fan, right? Does like a little blog thing for him, hosts like parties all the time. Like he's a massive fan of the Bills. Uh, it started for him back when um, they drafted Thurman Thomas from Oklahoma State Cowboys. Go Pokes. Um, and, then, uh, and, then, and then was solidified though when in 91, 92, 93, and 94, they set a record for going to four consecutive Super Bowls and lost all of them. And, and still to this day haven't won one. Listen, if you're a part of the Chiefs' kingdom, you don't know how that feels, right? Yeah, that's right. You got four. Believe me, I'm a Steelers fan. We got six. Maybe one day you'll know what it's like to not be able to fit all your rings on one hand. But until then, listen, I, I, listen, I digress. I digress. That's not the point. The point is, the point is, there is something about the Bills' unique shared history, their unique shared past that forms this really weirdly tight bond between their fans. And much like, uh, much like the Bills, although I certainly hope not, we have actually a shared past as well. We have a shared history as well. And in the same way, ours also is that we have all fallen short. Not in something that doesn't matter, like football. Actually, we have all fallen short in the thing that matters the most, the glory of God. My dad preaches at a church in Oklahoma, and he's fond of reminding the congregation down there of two truths that I would remind us of this morning. One, the person that you're sitting next to this morning is a sinner. And the second truth is that so is the person they're sitting next to, right? I would add a third bonus truth is that so is the guy standing up here talking to you right now. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. That word all that we translate there is actually what Paul said is is both. And he's talking to the Jews and the Gentiles, two groups that very much don't believe that they belong together. But what he's showing is how level this playing field actually is. He's saying that there is no distinction. Without exception, all are sinners before God. That is the point of departure for the whole redemptive work of God. That no one has anything to offer which could elicit the love of God or motivate his work of salvation. The truth of our shared history ensures that when we come into this place, we come in on level ground. No one is more or less deserving than the next. You won't find like names on seats or names on parking spaces or some kind of place of honor here. 
Whether you've been coming for 50 years or this is your very first time here, we all share this history of sin. When Martin Luther was asked what he contributed to his salvation, he said sin and resistance. And not one of us could claim to have contributed anything more. Every one of us deserve a life and eternity spent separated from God. But while our belonging begins there, it doesn't end there, does it? It goes much deeper than that. And that's a good thing because let's be honest, the group of people that just all belong together because they're all sinners, that is depressing, right? Like if we wanted that, we'd just go to an OU football game. You know what I mean? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Football's done and I'm just not over it yet. I just need to talk about it. Okay, so sorry. We don't belong together just because we have a shared past. We belong together, church, because we have a shared hope. That is what separates us from all the other groups that gather under all the other banners in the world, is that we have a shared hope. That verse, Romans 3.23, that we read earlier, that's only the first half of a sentence. The rest of it says this, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Hebrews 10, that we read earlier, it says it like this. I would remind you, Therefore, brothers and sisters, We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. That is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. So let us hold unswervingly to the what? Hope that we profess. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. We belong because the hope that we profess is the hope that we share. It's the hope of a life abundant that made new in the resurrected Christ who now sits at the right hand of the Father because his work of redeeming our shared past is fully and surely complete. We have been made new. We're healed, redeemed. We have a hope that is secured by a great high priest and shared by our church. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pause for just a second. And we're going to celebrate that hope together. There's a third reason that we belong together. But before we get to that, I want us just to take a second and remember the once and for all sacrifice of Christ by taking communion together. Let's just pause and do that now. Let's take a moment to acknowledge our collective need for a Savior and his saving grace in our lives. Because if it weren't for his death and resurrection, our shared past would also be our shared present and our shared future. It would end just as hopelessly as it began. But by his grace, we are saved. And by his righteousness, we are presented before the glorious presence of God without fault and with great joy. So let us, with great joy this morning, remember that. Commune, draw near to God and draw near to each other. There are tables, uh, there's this table here at the front, there's tables in the back and there's cups in there that have the, the juice in them that will remind us of the blood that was shed for us. There's crackers that will remind us of his body broken for us. So when you're ready, we're just gonna take a minute and just get, gather some people around you and let's celebrate this great hope that we share together in communion. I'm gonna pray for this. And then we can do this together. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, for your once and for all sacrifice for us. Thank you for the hope that we have in you, the hope that we share as your church. We thank you, Lord, that our shared past isn't our shared present or our shared future, Lord. But our hope is. We thank you.
is the third reason that we belong together. One is because of our shared past. The other is because of our shared hope. But we also belong because together as a church, we share a calling. We have a shared calling. Verse 24 of our text tells us this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. All throughout scripture, the church is given instructions on how it ought to live and how it ought to function as the bride of Christ. But few are as pointed and direct as our instruction, our calling to care for one another, to build one another up to encourage each other, to love one another. As a church, one of the most important things that we could possibly do is to take care of each other. Paul says it like this in Galatians chapter 6. He says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, right? All people. But especially those who what? Belong to the family of believers, all people. As we have opportunities, let's do good to all people. Let's not forget that. Let's not forsake that. But especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Jesus actually tells us when he's with his disciples in John 15, 16, 17, he actually says that it's by doing this, it's by loving one another well, by taking care of each other well, that the world will know two things. One is that we are his followers. That's how they will identify us as his followers. But secondly, and, more, and most importantly, it, will, it is how they will know, is how the world will know that he is real. Right? They will believe in him and the one who sent him. So church, take care of each other. Encourage each other. Boldly love each other. This is our calling from King Jesus himself. The church is his design for us to belong because it's not good for us to be alone. If I could for just a moment, I'd like to speak to those of you who are watching on our live stream this morning. <clears throat> and I want you to know, first of all, that if we didn't think that live, stream, that live streaming and recording our services was a good idea, we wouldn't do it. If we, if we thought it was bad for some reason, we would not make it available. So know that, know that first of all. And I also want you to know that the reason that we do this is because there's a lot of people who, um, for one reason or another, can't, uh, they, you know, they can't be here. Um, you know, because of a health issue, because they're sick, or they have a family member that's sick, or something. There's something that is preventing them from being here, you know. Um, or, or maybe you're traveling um, and you're catching up on this at like a later date or something like that. And we want you to know that if those things are true of you, we are so glad that you are worshiping with us in this way. Um, we, we really are. We're so glad that you've taken advantage of this and that you're making and that it's available to you. Um, but if you are available to be here, if you are able to be here and you choose not to be, and you're asking yourself the question, or maybe you're here and you're asking yourself the question. Maybe you've asked it before. I know I have asked it before. You're asking the question, do I have to go to church every Sunday to be a Christian? I want you to know that's the wrong question. We are the body of Christ. And there is something that happens when we're here together. And I'm not trying to stand in judgment. I promise. I'm not standing in judgment of you. I'm inviting you into something that is beautiful that God has for you. Inviting you in to join in to something that you were designed for. It's not, a, it's not a pressure or a challenge to commit. It's an invitation to belong. And I just, want you, I just want to encourage you this morning to examine your decisions as to when you're here and why you're not. I worked at this electrical company um, in, uh, in high school. And I remember, I remember having this conversation with this guy named Billy. He's a good guy, man. I loved every time I got a chance to work and, and go wire up a house with Billy or something like that, you know. And we'd always have great talks. And I remember one time I was talking with Billy, and he was, we were talking about church, and, and he was saying, man, you know, um, I, I, I can just, I can go fishing on a Sunday morning. And I can just be out by myself in, in nature and in silence. And doing that actually just gets me closer to God. It's more worshipful for me than, than, than going to a church ever would be. And listen, I get it. I'm a mountains guy, and there is something particularly spiritual and beautiful and worshipful about being alone in God's creation, right? About staring at his, about his majesty and his creation. It's amazing. It's awesome. 
Maybe for you it's not nature. Maybe it's staying at home with a good book in your Bible and you think to yourself, you know, the books that I read at home are by smart people, right? They're better than the sermons that are preached by our ministers. And listen, if it's me preaching especially, no arguments there, all right? I can't promise you that the, that the sermons given here or the worship sung here or the coffee drank here will be as good as the books you read or the music you listen to or the coffee that you make at home. What I can promise you is that there is a clear There is a clear and plain command of God to not give up meeting together, to gather in corporate worship. Spending time alone with God is so important. It is critical in our walk with him. But church, we need belonging to be who God made us to be. It is the anatomy of your soul. It's the core of your longings. The center of gravity in our relationship with Jesus is the church. It's not our hearts. It's not on some mountaintop or beach or living room. It is in the local gathering and the global unity of the blood-bought bride of Christ. So here's what I want you to know this morning. If you're here and you don't have a sense of belonging, if you feel alone this morning, I invite you to join us. Join us. Listen, we already know we share a past, right? We got that in common. We already know that. I want to invite you this morning to share in our hope and to share in our calling. Our God will do for you. I promise you, our God will do for you what he has done for us, which is to come and meet you in your loneliness and lead you into belonging. He will meet you there, but I promise he will never leave you there. Psalms tells us that God sets the lonely in families. I love that. He gives them a place to belong. And he does that through his church. So here's what we're going to do as we wrap up our time this morning. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to sing together in just a minute. We're going to continue to worship together. But we're also just going to practice this for a minute. We're going to practice this calling that we have to love each other well, to encourage one another, to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. If you are an introvert, I'm so sorry. If you're new here and you don't know anyone, that's okay. That's okay. You can just kind of sit or stand with us and you can kind of observe. There will be people up on the prayer platforms, by the way, that would love to pray with you. And if you're curious about what it means to share in this hope that we have or to share in this belonging or or you just need someone to pray with you, please go to the prayer platform. They would love to do that. But for the next few minutes, here's what we're going to do. We're going to encourage one another. We're going to stand together. And we're going to go find a person or two or three, and we're going to encourage them. Just tell them, just point out, listen, don't overcomplicate it. Be bold in the way that you do this. And don't make it, it doesn't have to be all thought out and beautiful and, and, you know, if they ain't crying, you ain't trying. It's nothing like that, right? It's just like, let's go, let's just go encourage one another. I'll tell you, I don't know where Cody's sitting. Cody, bro, I see Jesus in you, man. You are here every time these doors are open and you're serving by giving by, uh, by slinging coffee or by, you know, running camera or something like that. And if you're not, you're here anyway. And you come find me every Sunday. You ask how I'm doing. And I'm grateful for you, man. Thank you for that. I see Jesus in you, Cody. I do, bro. I do. I really do. Caden, out, out in the lobby earlier, you challenged me, man. You were just like, hey, let me give you a challenge this morning. And I appreciate That's bold, man. And you speak boldness. You speak boldly. And I appreciate that about you. Thank you for bravely and, and, uh, for bravely and boldly encouraging me this morning. I appreciate it. Corinth, I like the way I see, I see, I see your, just the joy of Jesus in the way that you worship. Um, I do. Um, and so I'm thankful for your joy in the way that you worship. I see it and I'm encouraged by it every Sunday. Let's do this this morning, okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand up. Right now, if you're able, if you're able, let's stand together, okay? And let's just take a second before we sing together and let's just boldly go, go find a couple of people. If you don't know who, ask the Lord to put somebody on your heart and just go find them. And if nothing else, just say, hey, can I pray for you real quick? Ask him how you can pray for them. Pray for somebody, encourage one another. And in just a few minutes, we'll sing together. Let's take some time and encourage each other this morning.
Man, if this isn't being the church, I don't know what is. This is awesome. I had to take some pictures. I'm laying down my life. I'm giving up control. And I'm looking back. I surrender all. I'm living for your glory. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, to see the nations bow, for all the world to know, I'm living for your glory. joy. It's, it's a praise song. Just thanking God for what he's doing this morning, what he's doing in this church and in the capital C church, what's going on around the world, around Jotham. So let's worship him this morning. the 
day. Yes, in Jesus' name, we thank you. You can have a seat as we finish out our service today. Praise the Lord indeed for the beauty of encouragement, for the beauty of God's word, for the power of his Holy Spirit, and for his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Continuing in our family celebration that we've been doing today, we get the beautiful, beautiful honor of honoring our families today. All the parents who had, all, you're probably all aware, all these new additions, we're going to see all these lovely, beautiful faces. If you would make your way to the stage with your lovely little ones now, that would be wonderful. We're going to have some time to pray over our families who have had new additions, babies, or by adoption. We want everyone to see these lovely, lovely faces. And while they're kind of making their way here, I'd love for you to see their faces and their names because names have so much power. These are some of the pictures and the names of our beautiful little ones who've been added to our church family. 
Look at them. I'm sure, I'm like, honey, you want another baby, right? <laughs> I won't tell you what his face looked like when I said that. <laughs> right? <laughs> if it were up to me. Uh, well, no, we are going to take some time and honor these lovely, lovely, look at this beauty. I love it so much. And it reminds me, as we're talking about family, that first family of Adam and Eve, that's how God began with family. He introduced his love for the world with family. So here's a passage of scripture I'd love to read. It's from Luke 18. And parents, this is so powerful. It says, now they were bringing even infants, babies to him so that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them saying, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is the beauty we have of bringing our kids to Jesus. The powerful at the feet of Jesus. So we're going to do that and pray for these lovely families. We have a gift from Miss Renee and our children's ministry families right here to your right of the stage. So when we're done praying, you're free, feel free to walk over there and grab that. We honor you parents today as well. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, for the honor, Lord God of being able to bring little ones into our family. I thank you, Lord, for the joy of parenthood. I thank you for even the hard times of parenting. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for a blessing over these families. I pray for these sweet little ones, God, that you, as we dedicate them to you today and hear them talking, girl, speaking, Lord, it's the beauty, that sweet savor that you love, the innocence of childhood. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love them, that you've spoken your name, their names before your throne. And we ask for your blessing over their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's honor them today. You guys can head over and get your gifts on that side. Oh, Miss Renee's bringing it. I love it. While, while Ms. Renee is doing that and they're getting their gifts, I would like to take this opportunity to remind you as we wind down that our service, we're still worshiping, and your kids, if you have kids, are still being discipled for the next 20 minutes. So feel free to spend some time with each other, just loving each other and checking in on each other, please. If you would like prayer today, whether it be for sickness or praise or you just came today and you realized, I would like to know more about this Jesus. I want to know him. Well, we are inviting you to him this morning. We want you to know you can make your way down to the prayer platforms there. We have people ready, ready and willing to pray with you. Before we go, though, I would like to just read one passage of scripture as our reminder that we have the power of the word upon us before we leave. The last thing we hear is from Jesus. It is this, from Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God protect you. May he send you help from his sanctuary and give you support from Zion. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of our God. Have a powerful and beautiful week. Let's take care of each other. We love you.